It's Friday, May 29th, T minus three days until primary election day in Montana, and we at MCV Cast have a big show lined up for this week. I'm Aaron Murphy, Executive Director of Montana Conservation Voters, along with Deputy Director Whitney Tani and Political Director Jake Brown. On last week's show, we discussed MCV's endorsed candidates, and today we get to hear from one of them. We're talking to Kathleen Williams, our MCV endorsed candidate for the U.S. Congress. We know that when it comes to conservation, she is the answer for Montana, and we cannot wait for her to follow in Jeanette Rankin's footsteps, and for you, our listeners, to hear from her today. When people put their faith in you, help you build a movement bigger than yourself. When they look you in the eye and tell you they believe in you, you don't give up. You double down. And Jay Kathleen Williams is headed into Tuesday's primary with a pretty clear advantage. Yeah, that's right, Murph. Uh, Kathleen has a pretty sizable war chest so far. She's actually raised $1.6 million, uh so far since the first announcing in 2019. And as of the last reporting deadline, she had $1.2 million cash on hand. So pretty clear front runner in the money race among Democrats. And she's also leading the Republicans as well. Well, we'll hear from Kathleen in a moment, but first some headlines, beginning with a development that did not get a lot of coverage in Montana this past week. Canada's TC Energy has completed the first 1.2-mile piece of the Keystone XL pipeline that crosses into northeastern Montana from Alberta. And according to the Associated Press, the company is now at work on building what some call man camps in Montana and in South Dakota, where the pipeline is supposed to go after it crosses through the Big Sky State on its way to the Gulf of Mexico, so its tar sands oil can be refined and shipped elsewhere. As we've mentioned on this show before, Judge Brian Morris a few weeks ago canceled TC Energy's permit to build the pipeline, saying the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers did not do enough to study the impacts of construction on endangered species. What does that mean? It means TC Energy is moving forward where it can, regardless of the limbo status in court. A few weeks ago, we asked former Montana Governor Brian Schweitzer about the KXL pipeline, and we will feature that interview soon, but here's a snippet of what he told us. I think it makes no sense, and whether it's the Keystone Pipeline or any other big construction project right now, um, there is some uh, additional politics at work. It's the Trump administration uh, who wants to have a victory for his political base that 40% that are going to be with him no matter what, who believe that uh, um, uh, climate change is a hoax, as he always describes it. Um, And they they just soon uh, use oil till the end of time. And uh, they think that a windmill causes cancer and uh, a solar panel is stupid. And so you have a you have a president who sees this as an opportunity uh, to get this pipeline built fast before anybody asks any more questions. We're rounding out our primary election in just a few days, and we wanted to give you one more plug at getting those ballots in. Every registered Montana voter should have received a ballot for the primary election, but it is now too late to mail them back. If you want to guarantee that your ballot will be counted, you'll need to drop them off in person at your county elections office. This primary election is really going to set the final stage for what we think will be the most significant election in Montana's history. If we want to do well in November, we have to elect conservation champions in the primary. And if you have any questions about voting or the candidates on the ballot, just give us a call at our office and we can help you figure it out. Happy voting, y'all. All voters in Montana received a Green Party ballot this year. And to be clear, Montana Conservation Voters has not endorsed any Green Party candidates. Only one of them, in fact, even asked for our endorsement. Maybe that's because the Montana Republican Party admitted to spending $100,000 to collect enough signatures to put so-called Green Party candidates on this year's ballot. That's a pretty brazen move. The GOP didn't even bother to hide the fact that it's trying to siphon conservation votes away from Democratic candidates. Well, we ain't fooled. In fact, we're only going to keep broadcasting news about this mess because it's bad for democracy. The latest development, a shady new single-candidate federal super PAC called Go Green Montana, is pumping tens of thousands of dollars into the contested U.S. Senate primary campaign of the Green Party's Wendy Fredrickson of Helena. The problem is, there's no record that Wendy Fredrickson is a member of the Green Party. 
The political consulting firm behind Go Green Montana, according to MTN News, is called Arena, based in Salt Lake City. The Montana GOP, including embattled Senator Steve Daines, has spent $1.7 million on Arena's services over the past decade. The only information we have is the publicly listed treasurer and custodian of records, someone named William Murray of Missoula. And this week, I called him up. Not available. Hi, this is a message for William. William, this is Aaron Murphy with Montana Conservation Voters Calling. Uh, We won't hold our breath, but we will go back to the Green Party of Montana, which seems to be in social distancing mode. We called them up too, but heard nothing. However, the Green Party of Montana did post a message on its Facebook page saying the Go Green Montana website is, quote, a conservative-backed page with absolutely no affiliation with the Montana Green Party, nor has the featured candidate chosen to reach out to us. That fact alone, that this is a page backed by a super PAC, automatically should reveal that the page hides an ultimate ulterior motive, end quote. As the U.S. Senate race heats up in Montana, Whitney is keeping her focus on some developments on Capitol Hill. That's right. Who could forget about funding our public lands through the Land and Water Conservation Fund as we near the finish line for full and permanent funding in Congress? Late last week, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell announced that the Great American Outdoors Act that includes this pertinent funding will be on the Senate's calendar in the next work period, which basically means the month of June. So we are game on. As a reminder, both Montana's Senators John Tester and Steve Daines are original co-sponsors for the bill, although our Congressman Greg Gianforte still has yet to pretend that he even supports it. Unfortunately, some in our state are already celebrating and acting like Senator Daines alone brought home the bacon. Better believe we're not falling for this fishy business and will be continuing to push Senator Daines to fulfill his promise to fully fund and permanently fund our public lands. In other news, federal judge Brian Morris struck down over 400 more oil and gas leases across the West, citing that the Bureau of Land Management failed to consider the effects on sage-grouse habitat. The BLM failed to follow a plan that the agency had written in 2015 that had protected critical habitat for the endangered bird. The decision by Judge Morris will force the BLM to follow the 2015 iteration of the plan and to return millions of dollars from oil and gas companies for over 300,000 acres of land this decision affects. This has been the second time in just over a month that Judge Brian Morris has canceled oil and gas leases, citing environmental concerns. As Montanans submit their ballots for our 2020 primary, it's always good to look back on history and who is on the playing field. Before we get to today's interview, let's listen to a clip about one candidate who is now running for the U.S. House of Representatives after failing to secure a seat in the U.S. Senate. Citizens of Montana. The people of Montana. Citizens of Montana. Uh, Citizens of Montana. The people of Montana. Unlike the other character you just heard, today's guest knows Montana. Today, we're speaking to Kathleen Williams, a Democratic candidate for Montana's single seat in the U.S. House of Representatives, currently held by Republican Greg Gianforte. Kathleen has a 33-year career in natural resources and policy that includes a stint at Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, working in water resource planning, and working directly with farmers and ranchers to conserve the American West. In 2010, she was elected to the Montana House of Representatives and served three two-year terms and sat on the Environmental Quality Council and the Natural Resource Committee. Kathleen first ran for the U.S. Congress in 2018 and has a 100% lifetime champion score with MCV as well as MCV's endorsement. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you. Great to be here. So getting right to it, how do you pronounce the name of our state? Montana. You pass. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This is such an incredible state uh, that deserves to be pronounced correctly. So you ran for Congress in 2018. Why are you running again and what skills will you take to Congress with you? Well, I believe strongly that Montanans deserve a true independent voice in Congress, um, someone who will work with people of all political stripes to get things done for this great state and not just focus on special interests. For my entire career, I've been bringing diverse interests together to craft win-win-win solutions to really thorny natural resource issues. And I really look forward to taking that art and skill to Washington, and Montana deserves it. 
So what are you hearing from voters across the state these days, especially because I'm sure it's hard to connect with them during the pandemic? I think many people know that I was known for um, uh, crisscrossing the state and campaigning and, and meeting Montanans uh, in their communities, whether it was from Plentywood to Derby and Troy to Broadus and everywhere in between. We put 75,000 miles on on the vehicles um, and uh, doing that. So it is different, but um, we're doing a lot by phone and, and online. And, and really, Montanans are, are talking about the, the, the same three big uh, topics that before the pandemic is just in a slightly more nuanced or more urgent way. And, and those three uh, big topics are, are fixing our healthcare system, the, the patchwork of a system that we have, and ensuring that Montanans all have access to affordable, quality healthcare. Um, and then fostering opportunity. I mean, the pandemic is shining a bright light on the, the widening uh, gap in opportunity in the, in the nation and, and here in Montana. Um, and then outdoor heritage, which I'm sure we're going to talk about quite a lot, which is um, ensuring that we protect our clean air and water and, and public lands and, uh, and respond to climate change. So that's what I'm hearing from Montanans as to what they care about. We know that public lands and stream access here in Montana are king. So what are you going to do to increase funding for our public lands and our fishing access sites? Well, I, you know, it's just on a, another um, uh, online event where we were talking a lot about the land, uh, land and Water Conservation Fund. And so there was a lot of uh, credit taking for uh, in our um, some of our folks in our uh, congressional delegation for permanently reauthorizing the Land and Water Conservation Fund. But all of us that have worked in this realm know that you can authorize something, but it doesn't mean anything unless you fund it. And so um, I have advocated for full funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund for uh, as long as I've been talking about it. Um, it, it benefits not only our, our public lands and facilities uh, um, that we often think of, you know, in our forests and parks, but also in urban areas, whether it's softball fields or, or swimming pools, um, so many of our communities benefit from uh, the projects that are funded through that fund. And, and in this pandemic, when one of the safest places is to be outside, I think there's a, a bit of a, a reappreciation of the outdoors that, that we need to capitalize on and, and foster and ensure that reacquaintance, um, which is creating some issues, especially in some of the southern states of just some of our public lands there being absolutely overrun. Uh, we need people in office that are going to be supportive both of the, the policies and the agencies being able to do their job and have the resources to do it. And Montanans can rely on me being that member of Congress. We really appreciate that, especially because we have asked Greg Gianforte several times to support the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and he continues to just not respond to us. So we're looking forward to having someone responsive there, especially because, as you mentioned, COVID is really showing why our public lands and our public spaces are so important in the outdoors. What do you think the biggest threat to our climate environment and public lands are? Well, I think there's there's uh, there's a few. Climate change is, you know, uh, the urgency of that issue and the need to address it is really um, uh, first and foremost in, uh, in many Montanans' minds. And, and I'm ready to hit the ground running on uh, addressing climate change. You know, there's a lot of scientific evidence that our forests won't be the kinds of forests that that we remember and and we won't have the type of snowpack and we obviously don't have the glaciers that we used to have so uh, as those effects happen you know the the other hazard is not having the mission or the commitment from policymakers funding wise and legislatively to allow the agencies to manage those lands in the way that uh, that they need to be managed, again, uh, especially under the 
increasing recreation demand that um, is happening, especially in the West. So between the, the immediate climatological changes and then the threats of not responding appropriately uh, bring additional threats. So what do we do to address the climate breakdown, um, especially in your position, hopefully as Montana's only representative in the House? There are ways to make this an opportunity. And, and I, I talk about, um, you know, Montana's a very diverse state. And, and when I talk about climate change, I talk about climate change uh, using that term in Missoula. And then when I'm out in Broadus and Ekalaka, we, we, the farmers out there are telling me that, you know, there's more tornadoes and, and that they're seeing earlier runoff and they're seeing a longer and more intense fire season. And, and so everyone is acknowledging that, um, that there are issues and that there are changes. Um, it, the key is what we do about it. So there is a, a full set of ideas um, on my website, KathleenForMontana.com, but I'll share a few of them here. One is that we need to recommit to the Paris Climate uh, Accord. And then I, I have crafted many of my ideas based on what I think we could pass in a, a continued divided political uh, landscape out there. Um, we've got to make this a uh, bipartisan topic, um, and, and I know I can help do that. We need to uh, foster renewables. I have talked about electrifying our transportation sector, the tra- well, at least the, the pre-pandemic transportation sector is the highest emitter of greenhouse gases um, in America. And if we can electrify that, we could create all kinds of job opportunities as we transition to a a cleaner uh, fuel economy and be ready. We've got to be ready for the energy consumers of the future. Um, We have seen how Montana has uh, suffered from a changing energy consumer landscape um, as the market has shifted towards people wanting renewables and away from coal and, and some of the, the fossil fuels. So we have got to get out ahead of that and be ready for the uh, energy consumers of the future. Let's kind of switch gears. Um, let's talk about Marilyn Matt. Um, who is your expected opponent in the general with his club for growth war chest and his significant funding lead over his other Republican contenders and this coming primary next week. What do you want people to know about you versus Matt Rosendale? Well, I appreciate you asking that because um, there are so many stark contrasts and the, the choice in November is um, is both critical and and stark, I guess I'd use that word again. So, um, and climate change is one of those areas where um, he doesn't see a human impact involved in climate change. He thinks that the issue is about uh, the government trying to control people. Um, He sponsored a bill to declare in the state legislature to declare climate change as beneficial to our uh, business uh, environment. And, you know, we know that whether you're in the agricultural sector or whether you're in the ski industry um, or whether it's, you know, any other sector that depends on a stable, predictable climate and, and weather patterns, it's not good for our, our business climate. And there has been uh, human uh, impact and acceleration. So uh, he's just that's only one area where he's just quite out of touch with Montanans, with science, with uh, what Montanans want, and what's practical for us to a- address in Congress. Montana has only one member of Congress, um, as we've discussed. And for the past few years, we've had Greg Gianforte, which talking about science, the guy still has a museum that has dinosaurs walking with humans. Yep. But what grade would you give his tenure and why? You know, um, I think it, one thing that you mentioned before about um, the fact that he hasn't responded to your questions, um, the number one job of a representative 
is to represent, which means to be grounded in Montana's hopes, struggles, and dreams, and to communicate, right? To answer people's questions. Um, last cycle, you know, he would not hold any public meetings about his proposal to release wilderness study areas um, without any public input. And so we, our campaign took it upon ourselves to hold public meetings and show that Montanans can come together and discuss in an informed, respectful manner issues that can be quite polarizing and, and that people are passionate about. And so as far as a grade, you know, I'm afraid maybe he just didn't show up to that school to get a grade in the first place. So we need to make sure that we have a, a representative in the sole U.S. House seat that's, that is going to be responsive, that's going to show up, that's going to talk to Montanans, that's going to answer questions and, and be truthful, honest and forthcoming um, and lead, not just warm the seat. Agreed. So we expect a lot of attack ads in the months to come, especially after our primary, which is just next week. So what would you like Montanans to know ahead of time? Uh, yeah, they're going to they're gonna continue to misrepresent myself and my record. I want Montanans to uh, have the opportunity to talk to me, to um, view the website, and to really value, honesty, integrity, stateswomanship in my case, civility, and all the things that I brought in my career in the legislature, um, and all the things that I can bring to Congress, and not be swayed by people that are either trying to reinvent themselves, and we can talk about that quite a bit, or, or those cheap sound bites that are just lazy labels that they try and plaster onto me that are both incorrect and cheap. So um, we want to make sure we get out uh, to talk to as many Montanans as possible. And I would just encourage Montanans to vote for the person. Don't be swayed by reinvention and to look beyond labels and misrepresentations. 100% and we're 100% with you. So how is it best to follow your work and your campaign? And if people want to get involved, what should they be doing? So the uh, the website has a, a get involved tab um, that people can, uh, they can go to the website, they can see the, the issues pages and what I'm proposing. Uh, and then there's a get involved, I think it's called get involved uh, tab where you can um, ask for a yard sign. You can sign up to volunteer. You can tell us what you'd like to do and, and uh, we'll get you in, as involved as we can. And then there's, there's the, the big bright red donate button that uh, is also a way to get involved. Well, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. Montana women are trailblazers, as we know, and we're excited to send you to Washington to represent us. So thanks so much for taking time for us today. Thanks, Whitney. And I would like to add that I so appreciate um, MCV's work and MCV's uh, endorsement of my campaign. I've been a fan of MCV um, since its inception and um, actively involved. And I just um, so appreciate the work you guys do and excited to uh, continue to help in the future. Rock on, kick butt. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks. A reminder that MCV's endorsements are not made by the staff of Montana Conservation Voters. The Independent Board of Directors of the MCV Congressional Action Fund makes all endorsement decisions about federal candidates and does not make decisions based on political party affiliation. All candidates, regardless of political affiliation, are welcome to seek MCV's endorsement. Speaking of endorsements, last week's episode of MCV Cast, episode 8, took a closer look at all of our endorsed candidates, and we invite you to check it out if you haven't yet voted. And while I'm plugging things, I'll also put in a plug for some exciting news about mtvoters.org, our website. We're just about to unveil a brand new, more user-friendly website, so please check it out. And when you do, please be sure to stop by our fundraising page to help keep our work going. And thank you. To close out today, please remember to follow us also on social media and share our platforms with your friends and your family, all at MTVoters. That's M-T-V-O-T-E-R-S. 
We share lots of good content, but something you'll see this week is a black bear fording the Flathead Lake near Murph's cabin. This bear swims better than in any human I've ever seen. So we had a little fun with Matt Rosendale's pronunciation of Montana, and we're not quite done yet. As we wrap up this week, here's a compilation of clips from when Auditor Rosendale was running for the U.S. Senate and when his toughest criticism came from his fellow Republicans. Yesterday, we learned that uh, Matt signed in 2015 some tax records under penalty of perjury that he was a Maryland resident. And, you know, if that was a mistake, then Matt, let's talk about it. Who, why do you sign something or that's blank? I just don't see how that could happen. You know, there's not a rancher in Montana that's going to vote for Matt knowing that he's releasing that uh, land board seat and going to be replaced by a Democrat. 